Welcome back, Kim 111 guys. We've got another uh, video answer key here, and this one deals with equilibrium. And we talked a lot about this in class. And this is really a, a just a simple, simple introduction, but it'll get you ready for that next exam. So let's dive right in and uh, take this one out. So this first question, right? We've got uh, a reaction with a bunch of let's see, we got a bunch of gases here, right? We've got some methane, some uh, dihydrogen sulfide, some carbon disulfide, and some hydrogen gas. And so whenever I, I, I look at a problem like this, the first thing I want to do is make sure I have an idea of what the equilibrium expression is going to look like. And so they're all gases, so they will change potentially concentration over time. So it's a good idea that we include them all, right? Remember, we do not include pure solids and pure liquids. Uh, for the reasons we talked about in class and reasons that you'll learn in other classes. But for right now, this first question wants to know uh, how we calculate Q and what is actually Q. And so the nice thing about equilibrium is the math is not very hard. So we look here and we say, okay, Q has the same algebraic uh, or, or you know numerical expression as K, right, that we'll see down here in part B. Um, the only difference is that Q is any time when you're not at equilibrium, right? So let's go ahead and write that expression now that I've talked about it a little bit. Remember that roughly it's products over reactants, right? So we're taking uh, carbon disulfide here, and the exponent here is one, so we don't have to worry about that one. And it's the product, right, of all of the products. So we'll take hydrogen gas here. And this one you do have the coefficient for. Please make sure you uh, pay attention to those because it's very easy to make a mistake when you're in a hurry and not include that uh, stoichiometric coefficient as an exponent, and that will throw your math way off. And then for our reactants, we have the concentration of uh, methane here. And methane is uh, has a one for its exponent, so we are stoichiometric coefficient. We don't worry about that. But the dihydrogen sulfide, right, has a two, so that's really important to put that one up there. So that's that's pretty simple. We talked about that quite a bit in class. Now we just need to plug numbers in. And remember that we talked about uh, these brackets uh, denoting uh, molar concentration, right? So concentration and molarity, and, and you got to be careful here because this problem gave you moles. Right, but you have to remember that moles per liter. So if you want to convert this one to 0 0.250 liters, another sig fig there, um, then you remember that molarity is moles per liter, and you have to think about that and plug in the concentrations. Even though you might be tempted just to copy the numbers down, you'll get it totally wrong. So please be careful about that. So all right, carbon disulfide. Uh, carbon disulfide, if you think about carbon disulfide right here, one mole over 0.25, so that's really easy. We can say we've got, uh, what, we've got 4.00 molar, and then for the hydrogen gas, we've got two moles divided by 0 0.250, so that's 8.00 moles, and please don't forget that exponent of four there, really important. And then come down here to good old methane. Methane had one, so that means divided by uh, 0.250, you get four. And then finally, um, we had two moles of dihydrogen sulfide, so that gives us, again, eight molar, right? I uh, can't write with this pen today, sorry. And then that's squared. So if you crank all that out, do your arithmetic here, to the right number of sig figs, I think I get something on the order of uh, 64. I'm going to erase that. It looks really bad. Sorry, guys. I'm trying to get this done late at night and I'm a little sleepy. Sorry. Okay, yeah, 64.0 is our reaction quotient, uh, abbreviated as Q. And so that tells you where the reaction is initially, and we know that a reaction is going to shift from initial conditions to equilibrium. Well, of course, unless it's already equilibrium, but uh, usually it's not when you start out. You throw a bunch of stuff in a container and it's gonna go to equilibrium. And Q gives us the first piece of the puzzle to find out which way is it gonna shift. Is it gonna shift towards reactants uh, or is it gonna shift towards products to reach equilibrium? And 64.0 seems like it's awful product heavy right now. So let's, let's keep that in mind. Now, we need to write the algebraic expression for K. 
And in this case, I told you Kc, right? So that deals with molar concentrations. If I gave you a Kp, that's typically just a, another expression of concentration and partial pressures. But again, it's all about equilibrium constant. It has the same expression here. So we're going to go ahead and um, write this down. But this time, I'm going to be a little bit more precise because you got our carbon disulfide here. And remember the concentration of carbon disulfide to get Q, it's any old concentration, but we have to be specific here. If you're talking about K, it's the molar concentration when you're at equilibrium, and that's really important. So remember, it's at equilibrium. Same thing for our hydrogen concentration, right? So that's gonna be to the fourth steel. And again, we're at equilibrium. That concentration at equilibrium is what we use to calculate the equilibrium constant. Uh, methane, again, the molar concentration at equilibrium. And then finally, that dihydrogen sulfide, it's raised to the second and it's at equilibrium. So very, very simple there. Scroll down a little bit. Um, on this one, it wants us to say, um, calculate the value of K. And I was nice enough to give you all of these really wonderful equilibrium concentrations. So pretty simple there. You have the same expression here. I'm just going to bring it down and save a little bit of time. Please make sure you're careful to actually uh, write the numbers that correspond. So here we've got the carbon disulfide. It's, it's this one down here, right? That's carbon disulfide. So that's going to be our uh, 2.44 molar. Um, and then the hydrogen, uh, that's going to be over here. And that's our, what is that? That's one point. 7, 6 raised to the fourth power, right? And then we've got our uh, methane there. So methane is going to be 5.56 molar, right? And then finally, the last one is our hydrogen di dihydrogen sulfide. And that's, that's a pretty big concentration there. That probably gives you some hint as to if this is going to be a very big number or small number. And I think if my calculator is correct, punch this in. I get something, it uh, looks like we're limited to three sig figs, so zero point, what is that, zero, three, four, two, and there you go. Um, hopefully my math is right on that. Uh, so there we go. So now we can say, okay, well, um, that's a pretty small number. If you compare it to our, our Q, right, you always want to compare uh, Q versus K. I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but um, this K is really small, right? And so um, if you look, I'm going to go ahead and write this down here. We had 64.0 versus 0 0.0342, right? On my two there. Um, if you think about that, um, that's, that's really quite a disparity there. And so here we say, okay, what does K tell us? Well, it tells us pretty much that that is a tiny number, much less than one. So um, at equilibrium, right? Um, at equilibrium, uh, the reaction, I would say, uh, is very, very, very uh, reactant rich, right? Uh, the reaction does not proceed very far forward in the forward direction as written up above uh, because that number is so small. So that can kind of tell you a hint about what the reaction uh, where it lies at equilibrium. If it had been a very large number, say much larger than one, then it would be um, favoring the products or be very product rich at equilibrium. And then finally down here at E, which way will it proceed from A, which was Q, right? Uh, to, and a reaction is always going to go from Q to try to reach to K. Uh, if this is the case, then uh, that 64 number up there, that was very product rich. It must shift to left, right, which is towards the reactants to reach equilibrium. There you go. And we talked about in class and uh, how that, that works. Now, this last one is talking about Le Chatelier, right? Le Chatelier tells us if you're at equilibrium and you disturb the system by some kind of perturbation, um, you can the reaction will have to shift to reestablish equilibrium, actually a new equilibrium position where that ratio has to uh, manipulate uh, to reach back to K like we just talked about. So um, what are, are some tricks that we could do in this case to increase the production of hydrogen gas? Well, hydrogen gas is a product, so what can we do to force that reaction to shift 
to products? Well, we could do a number of things, right? We could uh, we could um, add some reactant, right? We could add that methane. That would be one thing we would do, and that would uh, go from K to Q. And if you add reactant, right, you're increasing the, den the denominator, which makes that number smaller. So it has to go and produce more product to go back to K. By the same token, we could also add uh, the other reactant because both of these reactants are in the equilibrium expression, so both of those work. Uh, by the same uh, rule, we could therefore remove some of the products, right? We could remove some of the hydrogen gas, or we could remove some of the uh, carbon disulfide, and that would help the reaction shift to uh, the products. And then finally, the last thing we could do, right, is we could uh, we could reduce the pressure. And if we reduce the pressure, it will shift to the side that has the uh, larger number of moles of gas. And I think we had, what, three reactant moles versus five uh, product moles of gas, and that would help it shift. Uh, some of you want to jump to temperature, but I did not tell you anything about if this reaction is exothermic or endothermic. So for this specific problem, uh, you cannot decide uh, which way temperature would um, a temperature change would help or hurt you. So you gotta be careful about that. All right, this next one was a challenge problem. I, I promise I will not give you one like on like this number two on the exam, but I think it's a really fun um, kind of mathematical uh, dive into how equilibrium constants can be used to predict the actual concentrations at, at equilibrium. And so here you see I've I've given you an equilibrium constant which is really small, and we're talking about the dissolution of silver sulfate, which is not really a soluble salt at all, but um, even when we say something's not soluble, we really mean to say it's sparingly soluble. That means it's it's really, really, really low in concentration. And so let's let's take a look at this. And so let's write the chemical equation first. So you got to know the formula. Uh, silver has a one plus charge typically, and so we know that sulfate right has a two minus, and so we put those together, and we're dealing with the solid its equilibrium we know that because I've given you a K so we write the double arrow here and I'm going to say that this is uh, when we throw it into water and when we throw it into water we get uh, two uh, moles of the silver plus right and that is going to be aqueous uh, and there we go and in addition to that we get a mole of sulfate right and that's two minus and that's going to be aqueous as well and if you think about this, again, you want to always look. That's aqueous, that's aqueous. That means the concentrations can change over time. A solid, however, uh, we do not include a solid in our equilibrium expression. So let's go ahead and write that. So Kc uh, is equal to the concentration of silver plus squared, right? Because there's our coefficient there. That's really important. Times the uh, concentration of, oops, that's a negative sign. Let's get rid of that goofiness there okay good deal um, and so here we have the sulfate right and there we go we got that uh, in fact I will go ahead and just put my little equilibrium there because this is a case so we're looking at the equilibrium concentrations and in this case we're actually given a number right I gave you 1.5 times 10 to the negative 5 and and here again you can see that 10 to the negative 5 this reaction favors the reactants so you're going to be locked up in that solid and you're not going to get very much of that concentration. And so what we can see here is we can say, okay, well, I want you to estimate, right? And this is just a mathematical estimation. Later on, we'll learn how to actually solve this precisely. But what you could do, right, is you could say, okay, well, I want to know the silver concentration, right? I want to know the solubility of silver at equilibrium, which is this value here. Now I want to solve for that. And, you know, in mathematics all the time, we can say, okay, a simple algebra. We don't know something, we will call it a variable x, right? And then we could say, if we wanted to very, very roughly, we could call this x. And so we know that that's squared. So if you think about it, that all equals x to the cube. Um, and so we can set these equal to each other and solve. And if you do that, it's essentially what? It's going to be the cube root, right? The cube root of k. And that equals, if you just punch that in your calculator, um, I don't know, I think you get something kind of small, right? It's 0, 0.0, um, what is it, 2.5 molar, 
I think something like that. And again, that's it's not even an equals. It's a, it's an approximation because the the math here, the algebra is a little bit more complicated. I'm not gonna. Uh, worry about the stoichiometric coefficient here because it could be 2x but again I just wanted to estimate right I wanted to estimate you don't have to be precise here but that's a pretty good estimate of what the solubility might be and that shows you that the equilibrium constant can tell you a lot in terms of um, predicting concentrations at equilibrium which is very important uh, the next problem I think is a lot of fun it's it's more of a conceptual problem right we talked about these ideas of uh, graphing concentrations over time for a reaction and trying to figure out when things reach equilibrium and all that. And here I, I picked a biological one for you guys that are interested in you know biology and pre-health and uh, want to be doctors and all that kind of stuff. And so we've got hemoglobin, right? And hemoglobin is this uh, oxygen transport protein, right? Which is very, very important. And unfortunately, if it comes into contact with carbon monoxide, that's why carbon monoxide is so dangerous and you want to have a carbon monoxide detector in your home or your, 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 your dorm or whatever, at least in your house, um, you want to make sure that you keep this stuff away because I think the number I forget, uh, carbon monoxide outcompetes oxygen by like 40,000 times. It's that strong and so it can lock up that hemoglobin and you can you can actually die from carbon monoxide poisoning. Really really scary stuff. But anyway, um, I digress a little bit. So here we see that we have uh, the hemoglobin reacting with four carbonyls or carbon monoxide units and you get this complex here and so uh, it's saying what are the um, initial rates and how do you know when something reaches equilibrium? Well if you think about it, we have this hemoglobin. We're gonna, I'll pick a color here. We'll make hemoglobin green and we'll say, okay, well, um, you're gonna have a downward trend in concentration until the reaction reaches equilibrium and it levels out, right? And then we'll have um, this carbon monoxide and we'll say it has some initial concentration. And we know that for every one hemoglobin, we use up four. So that means the, or the carbon monoxide is being used up four times faster. And so we'll say, okay, we'll start here maybe. And if you think about the stoichiometry, if this one's being used up four times faster, it's gonna have a much steeper initial slope. So I will try to draw that like this. And then at some point it levels out, right? Like that. And then if you think about the product, the product is actually gonna be made, right? And its ratio is one to one. So it's gonna have a slope very similar, probably starting at zero, right? And it's gonna go something like that. And the neat thing is, is that the first question, oh no, I lost my, my plot here and it looked pretty good. There we go, that looks better, right? Um, here we say, okay, we've got um, these three things plotted and if you notice this zone right here, when there appears to be no net change, that's what you look for because that tells you you've reached equilibrium, right? That means at this point you see no net change in the concentration of hemoglobin, carbon monoxide, or this complex because the reaction forward in this direction equals the rate of the reaction in the reverse direction. And if that's the case, that's the definition of equilibrium. Very, very simple. You look for that no net change and you know you're at equilibrium. And it says, what are the initial relative rate, rates, right? So we can say this would be, um, you know, stoichiometry is one to four, um, right? And then here's, we can call this one. If you want to, you can say this is being used up. So it'd be a negative four, negative four, positive one because it's being produced. So anyway, there you go. You can look at the stoichiometry, one versus four versus one, and that tells you the relative rates of uh, consumption and formation and so anyway there you go pretty cool and again we talked a lot about these kind of plots and you should be able to do something like this just as a again I, I didn't give you and you you were given no numbers but you're just trying to approximate all right this last one is one of my favorites because again it deals with our our very good friend right uh, Le Chatelier and that's really important to think about what Le Chatelier was talking about with reactions at equilibrium and how you can um, apply a stress to make them shift one way or the other to go back to equilibrium. Well, I've given you, given you this really neat reaction. and You gotta be careful again 
um, we've got a solid, a gas, a solid, and a gas. And remember, whenever you see a solid or a pure liquid, you're not going to include them in the equilibrium expression. And so I always start these kinds of problems by just writing out the equilibrium expression. And so I'll say, okay, uh, don't worry about the solid. So I'm going to say I've got my concentration of carbon, and this is carbon dioxide, raised to the stoichiometric coefficient of 3 all over, we've got carbon monoxide down here, all over the reactant, right? And so, oh wow, that's a neat coincidence. Uh, they have the same coefficient. And that's our equilibrium expression, right? That's that's really important. That's an equal sign. Sorry about that. Um, so now we can we can I would say if you're going to do a Le Chatelier problem, you gotta you gotta make sure you've got all that going on because if you don't have that equilibrium expression written, you're going to have a hard time um, answering those those questions. Okay. So if we double the volume, remember if you double the volume, what happens? Doubling the volume gives everything twice as much room which means the pressure the pressure is decreased right and if the pressure is decreased you're going to go to the greatest number of moles of gas and in this case this is kind of a trick question unfortunately because you've got three on one side and three on the other so there's no difference and so in this case you have no uh, no shift right no shift either way because the this reaction is not pressure dependent really interesting there in this case we're going to increase the temperature and here we have to go back to the, the problem and we say, oh, it's exothermic. So what does that mean? That means heat is a product. So we can write heat over here as a product. And if we increase temperature, it's basically like putting heat into the reaction. And so we're going to shift back to the left, which is shift to uh, reactants, right? You add a product, you shift back. So there you go. Um, if we remove this iron, okay, you would be tempted maybe to say, oh, okay, that's a reactant. You're going to remove it and it's going to shift. No, 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 no. If it's not in the equilibrium expression, you don't worry about it. So solids do not impact it. So if that's a solid, right, that is a solid, uh, that is going to be no shift, right? And again, I'm not writing these down, but I'm explaining them as we go. So you should be able to think about these. So a solid does not impact the equilibrium position because it's not in the equilibrium expression, so don't worry about it. A catalyst is added. Okay, well all a catalyst does is it speeds up the reaction, but it speeds up the reaction in the forward and reverse direction, so it may help us get to equilibrium faster, but it will not shift the equilibrium, so um, in this case there will be no shift because we are not changing the equilibrium by adding a catalyst, we just help the reaction go from Q to K faster. And then finally this last one, you're adding some carbon dioxide. Well, carbon dioxide is a product. So if we add carbon dioxide, uh, we will shift right uh, to reactants. Very, very simple. So anyway, I hope this has helped. Uh, this is a, a very good representation, except for maybe number two of the types of questions you should be able to answer on an exam. I hope this has helped, and um, I'll see you very soon.